My name is Steve Kearns. I'm the Director of Product Management at Basis Technology. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about sort of analytics and solar and sort of keyword searches are really, really hugely important. You can't, I can't overstate how important the ability to, to effectively do search is. But I think that one of the things that we're going to see more and more of is, is sort of how we're using that and, and how we're using that capability and, and what, how we connect that to the rest of the things that our users are trying to get done. Um, and I think that you know, what we'll see here is analytics, in particular text analytics, is going to help us connect a lot of these dots. So just to give you a brief rundown on, on sort of what I'm going to talk about, I, I feel like I just sort of have to get the, the basis technology thing out of the way so that we can get down to business. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about metadata. And metadata really, for me, is going to be this, the, the additional information that comes along with the text. In, in some cases, e-commerce, it's almost all metadata. In fact, you've got a price, you've got a quantity, and then you've got some text, you've got the description, but that's mostly metadata. Um, but I think that sort of thinking about search as keyword search and then the usefulness of metadata sort of as a separate item and then combining the two might give us a, a, just a slightly different view on the role that analytics can play, and particularly text analytics, in making this whole process work. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit sort of deeper about the different text analytics techniques and sort of what's available and, and then some of the ways about how we can use them. And towards the end, I'm going to talk really specifically and dive in a little bit on um, how you actually configure this stuff inside of solar. Like, wh where does it go? How do you integrate it? How do you use all these things together? Um, so hopefully that's, uh, that's enough to get us started. Um, to get this out of the way, I do work for a commercial company. Um, we sell software. Um, we sell analytics software, text analytics and multilingual text analytics. Um, if you're processing data in many languages, um, many, many of our customers now and more and more over time have been using solar. Um, and what they find is that when you're dealing with many languages or dealing with complex problems, um, the, the open source tools that are available, while good in many, many ways, there are some gaps. And so these are the sort of gaps that we're filling. Um, so again, you know, we have an SDK. We've got plugins for Lucene and Solar. Um, and so this is just sort of the, the, the corporate pitch here briefly. But jumping right in. Um, talking about search, right, as I said, Solar is an incredible uh, search engine. It's got tons of features, tons of functionality. It's used on websites that we all use every day that we've all seen. Um, but when you start thinking about how these websites are being used, you, you, you're looking even here at, at something like StubHub. You're not just searching for text. You're searching to do something, right? Your goal is to buy a, t a set of tickets. Well, if I type in a band name, I want to buy the, the tickets from a particular location. I don't want to just see all of the tickets for all of their concerts of all time. I don't want to see tickets for concerts that have already happened. And so we can, you can already start to get an idea of where I'm going with some of the metadata things here. Um, metadata allows you to filter the set of results. You know, Google, of course, gives you a nice little uh, subset of things to filter by. Um, but in other cases, really, you're just searching across the structured metadata. If I'm going to Yahoo Finance and I want information on McDonald's, well, I'm going to start by typing in what I know. And then it's going to be looking through the metadata to pull that back. And then looking deeper, you can see we're pulling even more sort of structured information out, even though this is sort of at least nominally a search task is to find this stock or find this company that I want to look at. And so the importance of metadata really can't be overstated, I think, in terms of making the search useful to, uh, to the end users. But thinking about search and, and metadata, I mean, if we think about search all on its own, just keyword search, type in words, um, it really does help you find documents and find records. These are things you probably, you know, there's no other good way to do this. There's no other efficient way to search over large contents of unstructured information. Um, but the problem is you're getting back a ton of results if you're not filtering it, if you're not limiting the set of results that come back. And so how do you, how do you sort of dive in? And you know, search alone, how do you integrate it into a workflow? I want to buy tickets to a concert. Do I type in the band name? Do I type in the city name? How do I start filter? How do I find the particular concert that I want to get to? Uh, a lot of that comes down to using metadata to limit the set of results or to show the user just what's useful to them at that time, given the context they're operating in, who they are, and what tasks they're trying to accomplish. So by bringing metadata into the picture, you don't just sort of get, get a, a sort of way to integrate it into a workflow. You get new ways to look at the data, new ways to visualize it, navigate the data. You can explore it a little bit more. Um, and helps the users actually take action. So if I want to buy those tickets, well, I have to tell you what record I'm buying them for. Then you have to record that there's now one less ticket available for other people to buy. And so getting this involved in the whole process is really important. Um, the interesting thing here, sort of as a side note, is it also allows you to connect to other databases. So if you're, if you're sort of showing an article about you know, the, the, uh, the Red Sox latest loss, 
you might want to show some of the stats on how bad the pitching is, right? And so, you know, understanding who is being talked about, which pit, who is pitching that night, now you can start to bring those stats up, show them alongside the content, and it gives you a new way to connect this other information to give the user more of what they're looking for more quickly and more efficiently. Last thing I want to mention here is metadata also, in many cases, can give you new knobs to tune relevance. So if you think of, of some of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute, something like entity extraction, finding the people, the places, the locations that are mentioned, well, you might want to put a higher weight on those. If somebody searches for a person, you might say, this term is now much more important than any of the other terms because I know that it's an entity because it exists, right? So you boost that field in your query and, hey, now you've got more relevant results for your user if they're doing that type of action. So just keep that in mind. It just gives you more knobs to turn. Um, it doesn't solve the problem all on its own. You still have to figure out the right way to use them, but at least you have more information available to work with. And as I mentioned, linking to structured data sources is, is, is I think, a huge area that, um, that the industry still has a little ways to go, especially when you've got unstructured information. How do you link it back to the structured information? So thinking about how you use the metadata, going back to the, the sort of buying a stock example, or at least looking at a stock. So um, here we've got an example look, looking up McDonald's. I, I did a search, and I found, OK, here's the company that I'm looking for. It's pretty straightforward from a search perspective. But one of the interesting things is what they've done is they've actually run up news, so unstructured text now, that's related to the structured text. So in this case, I searched essentially structured information, but then we linked unstructured information to that to provide me more context so that if I want to learn more about this company, learn why the April sales surge, but they missed the anticipations, right? I can do that. I can do that much more efficiently than saying, oh, here's what the stock price is today. Now let me go over someplace else and type in McDonald's into Google News and then start reading there. This is just a more efficient way to get at the data. Whereas, again, as I was mentioning before with the, the Red Sox, you can sort of do it the other way around. You take your article, and then you start pulling up structured information relating to that article um, just by looking at the contents of the file. So in this case, we're actually pulling up the, the stats for the, the home stand here. And uh, or actually, I guess it's a, it's a way. Uh, but we can sort of see how this works. And the nice part is that tomorrow, if you go to the same page, that information is now updated because it's not necessarily you know, indexing the fact that you know, we lost uh, yesterday. It's, it's actually indexing the fact that this is the set of games that we're looking at so that when you're rendering the page, you can go and get more information. So I'll come back to some of the, the ways that you can do this um, and sort of the, the trade-off between early binding and late binding in terms of how you index your content. But just keep that in mind as, as sort of some of the different ways that you can use metadata. In terms of, of where does this metadata come from, right? a lot of it comes from the publishing process, right? You've got sort of an author. You know when it's published. And sort of you understand if, if you're selling things, what the part numbers are and things like that. That's structured information that just you need it to have the row at all. In a lot of cases, you also do manual annotation. Um, this is something where you might want to link um, you know, your, your, your article that we just saw against the Red Sox, against the particular team that they were playing. And so you know sort of their record, and you can look that type of thing up. That's sort of a manual way to do it. But how much of it can you automate? Um, and the automation, you, know, you can sort of think about automating it in many different ways, not just the, the unstructured text. But I think for, for my purposes here, I'm going to focus just on text analytics, how to get more out of the unstructured parts of the content that you have. And with that, I'll jump into to talking a little bit more about text analytics. Um, you know, conceptually, it's a set of automated analytical methods. But what we're really trying to do is add new metadata to the documents based on the text that you have. There's all kinds of different uh, approaches and technologies that you can use that you can bring to bear to try to get more information out. Um, but it, it, it's sort of a big mess. There's, there's so many different technologies, so many different approaches. Um, maybe I'll try to apply some of this text analytics to, to categorize the different types of technology into groups that sort of make sense. Um, and this will come in handy when we try to talk about how we integrate these different analytics into solar. So at the document level, right, the, the sort of the, the, the highest level, we want to know what languages we're working with, right? Is this document in English? Is this French? Is it Japanese? Is it Chinese? What are we working with? Other document level analytics, you might want summarization. This might be just a quick way to show a snippet. Maybe it's a way to show an abstract or something like that. And then, of course, there's categorization, putting this into a category. Is this a news article about technology? Is it about sports? Is it about um, finance? What are we looking at? And that gives you, again, another way to slice and dice the data. When you start looking inside documents, you have a lot more, uh, I guess, options available, a lot more different technology you can use. From the uh, from sort of the sub document analysis side, 
Um, there's a notion of lemmatization, and, and for those of you who have been to other of these conferences, normally I talk a lot about lemmatization. I'm going to talk a little bit about it here. Um, but this is really how you can improve the quality of keyword search just all on its own, by doing deeper analysis of the words to record the appropriate information, or I guess the dictionary forms of each word um, in the index. You can also do things like entity extraction, pulling out the people, the places, the dates, the times, email addresses, things like that, to add new structure to let you link across data sources, perhaps. And once you know where the entities are, maybe you want to do things like fact and relationship extraction, actually relating entities to one another within a document. There are things like topic extraction and some of the, the fun keywords there, the LDA, the LSA stuff, is really interesting under topic extraction. Um, and then, of course, in, if you're dealing with social media at all, you can't sort of go anywhere without hearing about sentiment. One of the areas that I don't hear nearly enough about, though, is cross-document analysis. And I think that this is one of the places where uh, the, the technology has been lagging behind in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that we're, all, we're, we're ready for, for some of the technology in this space. Um, when it comes to cross-document analysis, some, what I'm sort of talking about, uh, one, one method would be document clustering. We've got your Google News grouping similar results so you're not looking at 50 or 200 different stories about whatever Obama had for lunch today. Um, whereas in, on the other hand, um, maybe you want to go inside the documents and start relating those entities you found in document over here to the entities you find in document over there. Once you start being able to do that, anything else you find out about those entities, do you have facts about them, do you have relationships, do you have structured data even better? Maybe now you can start linking the entities between the documents and again structured data so now you have this whole extra pool of information to pull from when you're building your interfaces and trying to help your users, uh, I, I guess, identify the content that they're looking for. So really quickly, I think I want to just show one other you know, way that you can use some of these technologies. And uh, uh, as always, I think it's good to, to keep people awake by running a quick demo. Um, so it, it, just very quickly, uh, you know, bring, bring, here's a sample application that I built using just a few of the different technologies that I mentioned. Um, this is... Uh, Typically, we, we sort of show this to folks in the e-discovery space. If, if you're a lawyer trying to find um, sort of the hot document or the, the documents relevant to a case because you're suing somebody. Well, this is, this is an example. If you remember a few years back, the Enron, uh, the, that whole fiasco, um, they actually published all the emails from that. And so I grabbed those emails, and I ran them through language identification. I ran them through entity extraction and, and just grabbed some, some basic information out. From the dashboard here, we can see we've got you know, over 500,000 files, just, just emails. Um, and then we've got sort of some structured information that we could just pull right out of the files themselves, just who sent email to who, who received it, so we can get that. But when you start looking inside the content of the emails, you really start to understand what's going on. Um, you can see over here, despite the fact that uh, the person who sent the most email was somebody named K. Mann, the, the person who's mentioned most often is Vince Kaminsky. So it, we've already learned a little bit just by looking inside. And all of this was done automatically. So a human didn't go through and mark these up. The computer did that for us. And so we can start to get a little bit more information that way. And so we can see the people, the places, and the organizations that are mentioned here. And then we can start to do other things, like dive in a little bit deeper. Because we extracted all this content from the, from the articles, we, we extracted all the people, the places, the organizations, we kept track of them as we were pulling them out. So if I were to come in here and type, uh, Vincent, Vincent Kaminsky. What I really want to do is I want to find all the other ways that this guy has talked about across this set of documents. Now, what I can do is expand that uh, using a sort of fuzzy search capability. Now, Lucene and Solar have some built in. Um, there are better ways sort of out there. So if you have a problem shaped like this, you know, please talk to me afterwards. But just to show you some of the things that you can do with this information once you have it, is you can make this, these types of queries and then show them to the user. Allow the user interactively say, nope, um, Wincenti is not somebody that I'm interested in searching for. Let me remove them from the list. So now I've got a new way, a new way for my users to interact with the content. They can tell me what they want, and they can search more effectively knowing what's actually in the content as opposed to generating a list of possible variations and things like that. On the other hand, maybe I can do something smarter with, with just individual terms. Uh, if I take a term like why, maybe I want to know all the other ways that this term can be represented. Um, and so here I'm actually taking the term and I'm expanding it. Normally what we try to do is we try to reduce things in the index. But for a market like this one, they're really interested in understanding each individual term and what impact that has on the set of results that they get. And so being able to expand the uh, a sort of somewhat ambiguous term like lie 
into the many different sort of conjugated or inflected form can be a pretty powerful use case. But if I were to go ahead and, and, uh, and actually just run a search here, one of the other interesting things that we can start to do is, uh, is this near duplicate. Um, these aren't terribly good articles, unfortunately. I, uh, um, but, if, but if I were to actually drill in and take a look, what we're going to see is, is the ability to start grouping these. And you can actually see um, we're looking at near duplicate groups as opposed to individual articles. And so the individual articles here, I think, would, would number almost 14,000. But we're really just looking at 100 groups worth of information. And so because we've applied this clustering, because we know how the documents are related or how similar they are, they're near duplicate, we're actually able to then uh, sort of show just the groups or just the best match from each group and limit the set of results that come back. Uh, the feature in Solar that supports this is in Solar 4. And it's called field collapsing. It's a very, very powerful feature, which I think we're going to see a lot of people using very soon now. So that's a quick sort of snapshot of, of a couple of the ways you can use this stuff. But I think we're going to see uh, more and more of these different use cases over time. Diving back into the individual uh, components here, understanding the language of documents, of course, is very important. But also, figuring out when you have documents that have more than one language in them. So you're going to see some cases like that in some data sets. You need to recognize that. You need to be able to detect it. So figuring out what your content looks like is really one of the most important things you can do, is, is understand how your content's structured. Once you know that, you can start pulling up things like dashboards, and you can start using this information just very easily to start filtering or to start showing results in new ways. We're talking about categorization. This is something the news companies have sort of mastered, although they do most of it manually still. Um, figuring out how to let people see just the information they're interested in is absolutely crucial. So I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to just go to the, the website and hope that I see, you know, the latest SOC scores. I want to actually, like, know that I go to sports and that's where I'm going to find them. They're not going to be on the home page unless they win. Um, and that's not going to happen. So this is, this is really important um, to sort of think about how categorization plays into how your users end up finding the content. Um, briefly, I'll, I'll just for a minute go into linguistics. Um, what I really want to do is look at segmentation. This is a big problem for, for Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Thai. These languages are typically written without white space. So what do you do? You sort of have two options. Um, you can use the, an n-gram, the CJK analyzer built into Lucene and Solar. Allows you to do certain things like grab a sentence, and the, the, this is really called bigramming. So you take character one and two, and you make word one. Then you take character two and three, and you make word two. And so you sort of work your way down with an overlapping window of characters. What it allows, I guess, in, in some ways, is perfect recall. You'll never miss a document when you run a query. But the problem, what does that do to, to, to your precision? What does it do to your relevance? It sort of throws it out the window because instead of operating, at least in terms of relevance, on words, right? Your, your TF and your IDF are based on words. If you're no longer working with words, you're just working with characters near each other, it's going to, be, it's going to give you a different set of, of sort of results and, and order them in a different way that might not be as relevant as, as you might hope. The other approach is to use something like morphological segmentation where you're really trying to find where are the word boundaries and how do we use them. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that um, that we can sort of dive in and, and talk about some of the different technologies available for it. But I just want to call out, if you're searching with uh, or in, in Asian languages, make sure you understand how you're doing your indexing, because it's absolutely crucial to making sure your users are happy with the results. On the other hand, when you're dealing with European languages, you have a different set of problems, right? European languages are, are what the linguists call highly inflective. That means that they conjugate words, and they conjugate nouns in some languages, too. Um, and this becomes a big problem. Now, how, how sort of solar addresses this out of the box is, is it provides a number of different stemmers. And stemmers are, are sort of a naive approach. It, it basically is a set of rules that chop characters off of words. And it works great for a word like speaking. It knows how to turn speaking into speak because it knows, in English, ing is an ending I can chop off. Works pretty well. For a word like spoke, it doesn't work well at all. Uh, it also has other problems here, which sort of, sort of highlighted, where you can see it took a word like several and turned it into the word sever. So it actually incorrectly chopped off words in that case. So you have those two problems with stemming. Limitization, on the other hand, has an understanding of the language, has an understanding of the words in the language, and allows you to sort of, uh, I guess, ba based on how words are used, figure out what the correct dictionary form is, which can be really, really useful. In this case, we're able to take the word spoken, past tense conjugated form of to speak, and turn it into speak. So that now in my index, I've got the word speak. 
but not for every time I see the word spoke, just when it was used as a past tense verb. And so now when my users come to the system, they're going to be able to find, you know, they type speak, they find spoke, but only, only when it matches what they're interested in. So we're increasing the recall, but we're not hurting the precision by giving them results that aren't relevant. Again, as, as we saw a minute ago, this sort of notion of being able to run that process, that lemmatization process in reverse, if you understand all of the words in a, in a language, you can actually run this, this sort of linguistics backwards and you can say, given a, a conjugated or inflected form, find me all of the dictionary forms, then find me all of the inflected forms of those. And so that's sort of what we're able to do um, using the same type of technology of, of lemmatization. When it comes to sentiment, I mean, I'm, I'm not a sentiment expert. I'll come right out and tell you that. But the, uh, the, the important thing here is, is understanding what you're sort of uh, ascribing sentiment to. Is it a document? Is it a sentence? Or, or are you doing something smarter like ascribing it, you know, your sentiment against a specific entity or a specific aspect of that entity, right? You've, you know, if, if any of you are staying in the hotel, how would you rate the room? Okay, well, you'd rate the hotel one way. You'd rate the room one way. You'd rate the food one way. Um, you'd rate the conference another way. And so understanding what your sentiment is against is, is really, really important. And so making sure that your indexing strategy can, uh, can actually record that information and allow you to filter and show that information is really important. Um, sort of a naive approach would be something like that. But if we start to dive in and look at, you know, some of the more detailed information, you know, Google actually has a pretty good set of, uh, um, breakdowns for hotels, you start to, to understand why, why sentiment is it's actually a pretty hard problem in a lot of ways. For entity extraction, um, again, people, places, organizations, dates, times, email addresses, right out of the unstructured text. Um, this is the type of thing that, um, that we've had technology for at basis for a very long time, so this is one of the areas I'm very familiar with. There are countless different ways you can build these systems. There's something like, you know, gate out there that allows you to stack up sets and set and big, big lists of rules about if I see this word followed by this word, then it's an entity. If not followed by this other word or, or part of speech or something like that. Um, so you can build up rules to do some of this. Um, there's open source projects that you can go out and collect your own data and you can annotate it and then you can build models. There are commercial tools, of course, for it as well. Um, and the ways that you plug these into to, uh, Lucene and Solar, I guess it, it matters. And I'll come back to the right way to plug this type of technology in. So, also allows you to do notions of filtering and things like that. But going beyond that, once you've actually found the individual entities, right, now you want to know more about them. What can I tell you about this? Um, well, if we look at this particular example here, um, you know, focus a bit more on the government, but you can see here's, here's the group Al-Qaeda. We can see the locations that they operate in. We can see um, sort of who this individual is that we're looking at over on the left, who he's related to, and how all of these different networks or all these different individuals relate. Um, not just in terms of, of making a pretty graph, but actually in terms of using that to explore the data in a different way. And the visualizations of this information, you know, you can see them all over the place, and they're getting more popular. I think we're going to see even more of this over time. This is that notion of, uh, of co-reference resolution. So, you found an entity, Barack Obama, in document one. You come across a new document that says Barack Hussein Obama. Well, as people, we, we know they're probably talking about the same person. From the computer's perspective, how do you know? From a faceting perspective, how do you know? If you're building a dashboard, or you're trying to facet on information, you know, all of the things that I have highlighted here, these are all effectively errors from the end user perspective. Though from an entity extraction perspective, they're probably correct. But what co-reference resolution is trying to do is actually resolve those and say, the entity over there is the same as the entity over there, so collapse them and make sure that when you're showing them in documents or in, in facets or, or something like that, that you're actually just showing the, the ones that are correct. So you sort of reduce the number of um, replicas that you find, and that allows you to have better sets of results, the data works better, and the data is actually cleaner, at least it appears cleaner, but you haven't lost any real fidelity, so you still understand how it was, how they were mentioned in each of the individual documents. So this notion of near duplicate clustering is something that we sort of cover briefly in the demo, and you can start to understand how you pull these documents out, how you group them, and then how you can look at the differences between them. Um, just gives you a whole new way of, of looking at the data, and really it's almost like summarizing the results, and when somebody finds something they're interested in, they can drill in, 
but you don't make them look at every single individual document. And I think that's going to be a, a theme here as well. You see this all over the place now. Google News is doing it, everybody. Another thing you might want to do once you have entities to work with is search them, right? How do you search them effectively? And this is sort of the same idea that we looked at in the demo, but it's, it's actually being able to take the entities you found in documents and search across them in a new way. Um, it, it helps your users complete their searches. You could, instead of sort of showing a set of results like this, you could use it as a type ahead. You could use it as, as sort of assistance to say, did you mean? So there's a many different ways that you can work this into an interface. But I think the notion of having this extra data available is absolutely crucial to making sure that, uh, that you're helping your users find what they're looking for uh, quickly. All right. So we covered text analytics pretty quickly. Um, we covered sort of the broad categories, the document level, the sub-document level, and then uh, the sort of cross-document level. But how does that relate to solar? How do we index it? How do we run it? Where do we run it? When do we run it? Um, so th there's sort of, I guess, only a couple of places in solar that you can sort of plug this type of technology in. Um, the places that we have available are the analyzer chain, right? This is in Lucene as well as in solar. And the idea is that an analyzer gives you a tokenizer to find the words, and then it gives you a set of token filters to do stuff with the words. Um, it's limited in some ways, and I'll come back to the reasons why. But the next thing that we have is an update request processor. We're seeing a little bit, a little bit more uptake in, in update request processors over the last year than we did in, in sort of the previous few. And I think that's because the, the, more people are realizing what exactly you can do with them. Um, the update request processor runs, uh, I guess, before the field level analysis takes place. And so we're actually at, at sort of the outside saying, oh, a document has entered solar. What would you like to do to it before we start to index it? And it gives you a lot of power and a lot of opportunity to sort of get, get at the content before it goes all the way into the index. And so you can modify it on the way in, which can be really, really useful. Um, and of course, the other option is you just do all your analytics ahead of time and just send the output into solar. So analyzers. Tokenizers, token filters. They're great for linguistics. They're great for segmentation of Asian languages. They're great for lemmatization. Um, and if you want to customize your segmentation because your products, you know, your product names are different than everyone else's and, and you want to make sure it works the best for your content, that's where you do it. That, that's what you use a, a, an analyzer for. The limitations here, and, and the reason that I haven't put anything else that it's good for up, is, is that you don't have access to the rest of the document. At this point, at the point that an analyzer runs, you are in a field. You can see only as far as your field goes. You can't look at the field next to you. You can't add a new field to the document. And so you have no other context. You only know what, what the content is in that field. So you don't have the ability to say, oh, well, the language parameter on the document says this is French. So as my analyzer, I want to look at that and inform the way that I'm going to, to analyze the content field. You can't do that. There's no way to reach out and grab that. Um, I wish there was. Occasionally, I arm wrestle with Yannick about it. But, but I think it makes sense. There's no, there's no access at that level at that time. So that's sort of, I guess, from a high level what the analyzer is good for. In terms of its configuration, um, these, of, of course, you know, I think this is hopefully what most of us in the room are familiar with, dealing with the schema, dealing with the field types, and, and declaring an analyzer at index time and an analyzer at query time. Um, the only other thing to mention here that, that I haven't really touched on is the notion of a char filter. This is, again, one of these, these components that's less frequently used. Um, this allows you to apply uh, certain types of normalization to the text, things that might change the length of the text. If you're doing certain types of Unicode normalization, yeah, char filter is probably the right place to do that so that you don't end up with um, issues when it comes time to do highlighting or, or, or other types of issues relating to, uh, to sort of when and where you do uh, uh, Unicode normalization. The other thing just to mention here briefly is it is important, in fact, to think about indexing versus query time differently. Um, and, and you oftentimes want to do something different at query time than you did at indexing time. Not a lot different, but a little bit different. If, if I'm doing lemmatization, trying to find the best possible uh, form of a particular word, I, I see the word spoke, I know in this case that it's speak, I want to make sure that I'm doing that. On the other hand, at query time, there's no context. So I don't know if the word spoke is spoke, or the word spoke means speak. And so at that time, I have to actually search all of the possible dictionary forms that I can find. And so recognizing that you want to do something a little bit different sometimes at, at query time is good. You just have to make sure you think through the process. All right. 
the update request processor. As I said, this runs before the analyzers and gets full access to the document. So it, it can say, oh, I see a language field, great. Let me inform this, or better yet, let me move this content from field one into field two, or maybe from content to content English or content French or something like that. Um, it, it, it gives you, I guess, a lot more power. What it also allows you to do is run a full set of analytics right inside of Solar. So you can actually go ahead and, and say, inside my Solar JVM, run this big analytic process, run the entity extractor, run a language identifier right inside of Solar. It's pretty powerful. It's pretty useful if you've already got a good infrastructure for deploying, you know, 10, 15, 20, 100 Solars. But you have to sort of think about what's the computational cost of running the text analytics versus the computational cost of indexing the text. Indexing the text is really fast. It's really, really, really fast, especially in Solar 4. But the text analytics is going to be a little bit slower. And so if, if your sort of bottleneck is throughput of indexing, you want to really think about whether you want to run the, the analysis inside of Solar at the time you're doing the indexing, or whether you want to sort of fan that out, the, the indexing, to several machines, or sorry, fan out the analysis to several machines that all feed the results back into Solar, uh, that might be one way you could do it. Or if you want to run the, the analysis sort of externally, if you want to do software as a service or something like that, an update request processor can just make a call out over the network, send, hey, here's my data, get back the, the, the you know, XML formatted set of results, and then annotate the, the document object inside Solar at that time. So it's really about where you want to do the computation and when you want to do the computation. Um, and so as you're starting to think about which of these different pieces of analytics make sense for you, think about how it affects your indexing strategy and, and, and sort of when and where you want to pay the, the, the computational cost. So if you're going to run the analysis in Solar, how do you want to do it? Right? Which ones are the best ones? You really want to try to, to stick to lightweight, stateless document analytics. Things that run really fast are best. Language identification, that's a good candidate. Not really good for cross-document analysis, though, because when you're inside of Solar, well, can you, can, can you search Solar to find out what Solar already knows about and, and what all the other documents are, are already contain? I guess you could, but it seems a little bit strange. So, so cross-document analytics, I think, belong, for the most part, outside of Solar. Um, and again, if you're calling out, there's all kinds of different ways to do this. And you know, as, as the newer versions of, uh, of Solar are released, what, what you're actually seeing is a lot more of these, these connectors show up. Um, you know, Weem has been around for a while. There's you know, these different plugins for connecting to web services, connecting to Open Pipeline. I'm sure there's one for things like Open Calais and, and, and so forth. So being able to sort of recognize that those are available and that they're there is really important as long as you also recognize that every time you make an external call, you want to make sure it's synchronous because, well, you don't want to index the document before you're done getting the content for the document. And so it is still going to slow down your process, even though it's not going to cost you any computation on your machines. Where do you configure these? Um, for those that aren't familiar, the, the solar config is where this all lives. And you can configure a request handler to have a whole chain of different update request processors that, that execute. Um, and so you can modify the, you know, the solar config pretty easily. And there are, there are actually some examples commented out in the solar config that allow you to very quickly look and say, oh, okay, here's how I might add an MD5 to this. Here's how I might you know, add a, a little bit more information. Um, and by sort of working with those and, and sort of by figuring out where exactly you want to put these things, you can, uh, you can do things fairly efficiently in, in the solar config, though there is a bit of a learning curve. So give yourself a day or two to, uh, to experiment. Now, if you're going to integrate solar sort of as the last step of your pipeline, I think that makes sense for a number of different use cases. Maybe not all, but a, but a number of them. If you're doing a lot of different analytics, if you're doing entity extraction and co-reference resolution and document clustering and, and you know, all kinds of other analytics, probably solar isn't the right place to be running all of that, and it isn't the right place to be managing all of that particularly when your individual components sort of have a, a, an implied order that they need to run it, right? If you're, if you're going to do entity extraction, you've got to know the language first. So now you've got to run the language before you run any of the other analytics. Okay, that's relatively easy to just code. But as you start adding more and more to the pipe, it really becomes important to look at um, uh, sort of how the, the dependency graph works out between your different components so that, you know, 
so that you understand at least how you're managing that. And there's a bunch of different document processing pipelines. You know, open pipeline is one. Wema is sort of one as well, sort of. It is, but it's a little harder to use. Um, but understanding that is real important. And if you need scale, if you need really high scale at the analytics side, you're going to want to run this outside of solar. It's, it's not that solar isn't capable, it's that solar's got its own job to do, and, uh, and it's different from text analytics. And so recognizing where on the spectrum of run it in solar, run it outside of solar you're sitting is, uh, is pretty important. But of course, there's limitations, right? Every time you add a new piece, every time you add a new you know, data store, every time you add a new processing component or a new JVM running on the machine, that's something else you have to manage. It's a new point of failure. How do you know when it's down? And if it goes down, you know, when and where do you uh, uh, recognize that? Do you stop indexing altogether? So there are a lot of uh, sort of hard parts to this, and, and getting it right is important. So you really do have to take a, take a minute, think it through, and uh, uh, sort of work with it. Another limitation, I think, is, uh, is really, if, if you're building your own pipeline, I guess you could, but you, you sort of can't easily use Solar's content acquisition features, right? It's got a nice integration of Tika if you're posting documents directly. It's got a nice sort of crawler nearby. It's got, it's got all kinds of technology right nearby. And a lot of different sort of, um, sort of repositories have neat ways to connect to Solar. But if, if you're trying to insert yourself in the middle as a whole document processing pipeline, as the content comes in, you sort of want to pretend you're Solar and do a lot of the things that Solar was doing about, oh, well, I want to extract the content from this file. I want to start formatting the text in a way that makes sense. And then I want to add new, new content, right? I want to add new metadata based on the analytics. And so um, in some ways, you almost want to fake being Solar. But I guess you just have to think about it as a limitation. Um, you know, you, you can use Tika. You can use all of the other tools. And, and you know, it's a good thing they're all open source because it's very easy to, to get at Tika. It's very easy to get at some of the other components. But recognize that when you're doing this, you do have to go and grab them. And you do have to assemble them in a way that makes sense. Um, and so, you know, I think that for, for really complex cases, yes, the analytics doesn't belong in solar. But really think through all of the steps that you're going to need to do before indexing and make sure you have the right framework in place to get it done sort of efficiently and effectively. So. There are many different ways that, that you can do this, and there are many different types of analytics available. Um, the document level stuff, again, you, you can really run it in an update request processor. Um, as it gets more complex, maybe you won't, but, but at least at first, I think that's the right place to start. Um, Sub-document analysis, maybe you can use an update request processor. Um, maybe you can call it to an external service to get some of the content. Maybe that's a nice way to start, a good way to experiment. Um, but for cross-document analysis, you really can't get around running this stuff externally. Um, and for multiple components, again, external pipelines are the way to go. So other concerns. After having built a couple of systems using a number of these different technologies, um, you realize that re-indexing is expensive. Um, and so when you're starting to think about how you link against structured data, or as you're producing your own structured data, right, this, this notion of cross-document co-reference resolution, Obama over there, Barack Obama over there is the same person. Well, I want that to show up as the same string in all of my facets, right? I want to show Barack Obama or Barack, President Barack Obama in my facets. But if I have to re-index all documents that mention Barack Obama every time I change the label that I want to use for Barack Obama, that becomes a real overhead, right? I'm indexing half the documents if it's a popular entity. And so if, if you're just sort of indexing this as, as sort of reference data or for visualization only. Um, maybe you can get away with just indexing an ID. And then have your UI take that ID, look it up, and then return the name appropriately. Um, the cool thing here is, well, you can still filter on that. You can still group on that. You can still do all of your other sort of faceting and, and filtering and navigation um, using just the ID. But your users are seeing the text that they want to see. Uh, so. So this is sort of the, the, the debate between early binding and late binding um, of, of strings. And I think for, for cross-document analytics or, or when you're linking against structured data, you have to think about how fast the data underneath you is moving, the data that you're linking to. So if you're linking to a database, is it updated every day? Is it updated every week? Can I afford to re-index all of my text every time that database changes? And how quickly do the, do the changes from the database have to show up in my, um, in my search engine? Recognizing that, I think, will help you figure out whether, uh, whether you want to index the, 
the, the, the, an ID or whether you want to index the full content. Because if the content is static that you're linking against, great. Index it, denormalize, go for it. That, that's the right answer for you. Um, but make sure that you don't want to later come back and, and use IDs because you'll have spent a lot of time doing other things. Um, and as I mentioned before, field collapsing is this, this neat uh, feature in, in solar, and hopefully a bunch of you have, have tried it out. It's basically, it's the functional equivalent of the SQL group by clause. It allows you to group documents according to a particular um, aspect or a particular piece of metadata. So you can say, all, you know, show me the top results from each category where you know, I've run a search for McDonald's. I want to see across technology. I want to see across business. I want to see across sports. Um, you probably don't see many hits for McDonald's in sports, but you get the idea of being able to show just one um, hit or just a small subset of hits from each category using this notion of field collapsing where it's showing you just the most relevant from each group. Um, there's still a pretty big performance hit here when you're doing field collapsing, but I think for the most part it's, it's going to be worth it for your users because they have fewer results to look at, and, uh, and I think that's a, a pretty powerful, uh, uh, I don't know, pretty powerful way to show the data. So I've covered all kinds of different things here. You can imagine different types of dashboards. You can imagine different ways that search content shows up. Um, you can imagine different ways to visualize. Now, this is perhaps the most boring way to show entity extraction in history, um, but everybody does it. Although, if you take a, a, a sort of slightly different view, and you say, OK, I've never seen this guy before. Maybe I want to know more about him. Instead of just being a colored text on the page, now maybe that's a link to either run a new search or to, to actually run a new faceted search to show me just documents that mention that individual. And so that's a new way to use this content. Instead of just showing pretty highlighted pictures, we're actually using it to get work done. That notion of entity search across documents, we saw it at one point in the, uh, in the demo earlier. Here's another way that you can do it. You type in the name you know. You find all the other spellings that occurred across the set of documents. And in this case, I'm just doing a dumb expand my query. I just put quotes and an or in between all of them. It's pretty straightforward. So lots of different ways to use some of this technology. Building up these graphs, building up these charts is really important. You know, at the end of the day, you have a lot of content, and you're trying to help sort of organize it with text analytics to help your end users be more productive, right? And that, I think, is the goal that we're all trying to sort of get at here. So with that, um, I think that sort of concludes the talk. Uh, certainly, I think I have a few minutes left for, uh, for, for questions if you're interested. <laughs> you got a question over here? So the question was, um, will, will running external analytics from the update request processor really stall your, uh, your indexing thread? I don't think that it will. Um, that might be a good question for the, uh, for, for the stump the chump, though, um, because I, I, I think that at this point, at least in Solar 4, that, that there's full multi-threaded indexing, and so that you could just have multiple threads sending content in. Instead of just waiting for the response from your one, you could just send two in and parallelize it in that way. Yeah, yeah, that might be the right place. All right, thank you very much.